So uh, first let me start, uh, you know, it's always interesting when your life passes in front of your eyes like that, that's usually not a good thing, but today uh, it's really uh, a tremendous honor. So uh, Brother Norman uh, Abbott, I, I want to thank you and the entire uh, St. Vincent community for uh, this incredible honor. This is, a, this is the highest honor a, a college can provide and I'm deeply touched and it means even more uh, because of the tie between St. Benedict's and my own alma mater, uh, Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. In fact, I've been remarking all afternoon this feels like going back to Kansas. Um, so I want to thank you, um, but most of all I want to thank you, our graduates, uh, because you've allowed me to uh, share this very special day um, as your commencement speaker as well. So let me start with the obvious. Uh, you made it. Congratulations, class of 2014. Well done. You're going to hear that all afternoon, so that's one of the thrills of being a commencement speaker. I get to be first. I also want to acknowledge your fan club uh, assembled around you. Um, unlike when I was in your shoes uh, 29 years ago, kind of scary, uh, when <laughs> You know, I was thinking as a student, so I was uh, hoping for the speech to be over, get out and uh, celebrate uh, being done and the commencement. Um, as a parent now, with my son uh, about to sit uh, in your shoes next year, it's a very different feeling because as a parent, uh, we've watched you grow and become adults in front of our own eyes. And nothing more dramatic than the growth uh, that's occurred over the past four years. Uh, so we're bursting with pride. I know they are. That's why they're here to support you. They're probably a little happy. The tuition uh, check writing is over as well. But uh, let's uh, also give them a round of applause for all their love and support. And don't forget, tomorrow's Mother's Day, so you're not done. So, so you did it. Congratulations, you're about to get a diploma. The question I have for you is, what does it mean? So, as I said, when I was sitting in your shoes 29 years ago, let me tell you what was going through my mind. I was pretty happy, uh, okay, deliriously happy, uh, about being done. I was um, a little sad at all the goodbyes that were about to happen. And frankly, I was a bit freaked out because I didn't really know what I was going to be doing next. I'll be honest, I had not focused very closely on what I would be doing after college. And actually, that was a pattern for me. I wasn't really that focused what I was going to be doing after college when I started college. Um, I was born and raised in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Pennsylvania parents, but raised in New Mexico. And went to St. Pius High School. Uh, but what was occupying my attention at that time was something I was doing uh, in the summers. I was a volunteer of an organization called Amigos de las Americas, or Friends of the Americas, which was a group that would go to Latin America uh, over the summer and do public health services during the summer months. So think of it like the Peace Corps, but in high school and college, so 16-year-old and over. And uh, by the time I was starting Benedictine, I had been doing it for two years. First as a dental program volunteer, teaching kids about dental hygiene and how to brush their teeth in rural Mexico. And the following summer uh, in Honduras on the North Coast, uh, digging wells and installing latrines in rural communities. And it was an amazing experience. There were no adults with us. This was a youth-run, youth-managed program. We were in Latin America by ourselves. I was uh, beginning my management career, I guess. I was managing a budget, travel, working with local government officials, arranging housing, um, and it was uh, you know, sharing time with simply a remarkable group. And this experience really framed my approach to college. How is that so? Well, here's what I was thinking. Independence. Uh, I liked being independent, and I wasn't going to go to college near home. That was number one. I didn't want to spend any time looking for college. I was pretty busy with this volunteer program. So uh, I actually selected Benedictine's Sight Unseen. Uh, it turns out there was a very effective uh, recruiter working Albuquerque that year. 
and about five or six of our small class from uh, St. Pius uh, joined Benedict in that summer. So Brother Norman, pay attention to your recruiting staff. They're very important. And I also wanted to go back uh, to Latin America the following year, so I was very interested in having a roommate who spoke Spanish from Latin America so I could really uh, stay on top. So these were obviously not the longest range goals, but it worked out. Uh, I ended up loving Benedictine, and I thrived in school, ended up with these degrees, and as I sat in that chair where you are today, my goals were still kind of similar. I don't want to go home yet. I want to stay with my friends, and I need to figure out what I'm going to do next. Maybe I'll teach. And uh, by the way, I hope your planning is going a little better than mine was at that time. So it worked out. Again, I ended up uh, that summer uh, working in Topeka, Kansas with my friends, my former college roommates, uh, taking classes that would enable me to start teaching in the fall. And there I was that summer working and uh, waiting tables, to be honest, in a local restaurant. And who shows up but one of the uh, nuns from Benedictine College who sits at my table. I thought, this will be fun. I put the napkin in front of her and said, Sister Mary Hope, what can I get you to drink? Turned out this was one of those moments in your life where everything changes. Turns out she uh, had been the Dean of Student Affairs and had recently taken a position as the principal of a high school in St. Joe, Missouri, and she was looking for a science teacher. She knew I was thinking about teaching, so she had come down to Topeka to see if I would be interested. So a few months later, I was in St. Joe, Missouri, teaching physics, chemistry, and math. It was both the hardest job I've ever done in my life and the most rewarding. And it changed my life, but not in the way you might expect. I didn't stay, obviously, and, and become a high school teacher, but working with those students rekindled a real love of uh, wanting to teach at a higher level, and uh, so I decided to go uh, back to grad school. And so a few months after that, I was enrolling at Pitt to start my doctoral work in physics. So why am I telling you this uh, story? I'm not encouraging you to uh, just embark on a random walk in life, but to illustrate that the opportunities you're going to face are often, almost never in my case, predictable from the outset. What you have to be prepared for is when those opportunities show up, be ready to take advantage of them. So the diploma you're receiving today can best be thought of as a key. It can unlock real doors of opportunity. And in fact, this key, of this, uh, key role for a uh, diploma has never been more important. Your diploma, it turns out, is incredibly valuable. In fact, the, college, the value of a college degree has probably never been higher. A recent Pew Research report uh, pointed out that on virtually every single measure of economic well-being and career attainment, whether that's personal earnings to job satisfaction or how many people are employed, young college graduates are outperforming their peers with less education. And what's more important, today's young adults, when compared with past generations, the disparity in economic outcome between college graduates and those with a high school diploma or less has never been greater in the modern era. Now, it may not feel like that to you as you're looking for a job, but the truth of the matter is um, a lot of that disparity is happening not so much because of the enormous growth uh, in the attainment of, of those with degrees, but actually the loss of uh, value for those who don't have the education. And interestingly, uh, the other thing that's happened is since I received my degree, uh, the fraction of our population that is your age with degrees has doubled. So clearly it's not as unique as it once was. So this key you hold will actually be essential to unlocking a set of futures for you. And think about it. Those who are, don't have a diploma uh, clearly face a much smaller universe of choices. But the truth of the matter is that key will not make the choice for you. Um, it doesn't promise you happiness. There's no entitlement to it. And in fact, when you open that door with your diploma, you may find a journey to a lot more doors on the other side, which is kind of what happened to me. 
My diploma allowed me to become a teacher. Becoming a teacher opened a door to going back to school and becoming a physicist. Being a research physicist opened a door to a whole career in public service and government. And that government experience has in turn opened a door to coming back to education, but in a very different role than I might have anticipated at the University of Pittsburgh. So this is sort of the depressing part of my comments, because if you've been paying attention, you realize I've now managed to say some very lofty things about your achievements, but not give you a single piece of good advice. And if I have to be honest, if I was listening to this 29 years ago, I can't say I would have found it particularly helpful. And that's fair. So, and the problem, of course, is that this future you're facing is so full of possibilities and unexpected turns that those of us who have done it can't offer you anything specifically helpful. So instead of looking forward, I want to help you by looking backwards. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Close your eyes. This will be quick. And I want you to forget about all the joyous things that are happening today, all the good things. And I want you to think about what hurts. What are you going to miss most as you leave St. Vincent's? Okay, you got your list. Open your eyes. Now be honest. How many of you thought of the classes, the homework, the test, and all the other things that contributed to your degree? <laughs> There's always one, right? <laughs> I thought so. So that was pretty, uh, that was about what I felt. And in fact, your commencement is coinciding with a commencement of my own. As, uh, as you've heard, I'm leaving uh, a government uh, career that I've held for nearly 21 years and about to commence a wonderful opportunity as chancellor at Pittsburgh. And it's, it, it's exciting to think about the new possibilities but it is also a painful experience for me. I will be leaving things behind, and it hurts. And the reason I think that is worth paying attention to is that pain is telling you something. It's telling you the things that matter. So I work with a lot of people now. The Department of Commerce has 45,000 employees. And I get a lot of opportunities to talk to people about what called them into service, why they stay, why they leave, what are they going to miss. And it turns out that their experience about what matters coincides with my own quite a bit. And if you go to a retirement party or a departure party, if you talk to your friends today, I suspect you will find three common things that define what we miss most under these circumstances. The first was the joy or satisfaction that came from a challenge. The second was this community, your friends, co-workers and colleagues, and mission, and I'll come back to that. So this week is National Public Service Recognition Week, and all across the federal government we've been hosting a number of events to remind ourselves about the value and the honor of serving the public uh, through government. So we've been meeting with new employees and, and hosting a number of events, and for me the highlight this week uh, happened on Tuesday when I went to the U.S. Capitol and joined a group uh, of remarkable individuals. It's an event called the Service to America Medals, and it's hosted by the Partnership for Public Service. And they were recognizing 33 finalists for this program. These are the rock stars in the government world. This is an, a remarkable group of public servants who are scientists who have uh, charted new territory, and for example, this year uh, exploring the mysteries of Antarctica, there are law enforcement agents who have cracked difficult cases of police brutality or guard brutality in prisons. Uh, there are lawyers who are fighting human trafficking and slavery around the world. Uh, last year, one of the honorees was uh, uh, actually a, uh, a spy who was saving hostages during the Iran-Contra. In fact, you might have seen the movie. It was a real person. Uh, and there's first responders who have responded to Hurricane Sandy. Uh, who are protecting our communities. It's really a remarkable group of people. And part of that event was a, a video, a set of videos that each of these folks did that talked about why this service was important to them. And one of these scientists was a uh, NASA scientist by the name of David Lavery, who led the Curiosity mission on Mars, the rover. And he said, the key to making a difference was the passion you brought to your work. So his advice was find something that you were utterly passionate about. Do that. 
because then you will make a difference, which is almost backwards from the way we usually think of this. So if, if I talk to the highest achievers I've ever met, whether it's a Nobel Prize winner at NIST or a CEO of a company, and I talk about, ask them about their work, they never make it sound like work. They never talk to me about the hours or the paycheck or the benefit package. What they talk about is the excitement, the challenge of doing something new, uh, the passion that they believe about their work, the chase. And I think this is the difference between work and a vocation. I believe we are all born with innate talents and gifts, abilities. And I also believe we were born with a need to use them. So when you're using your talents, it's deeply fulfilling. When that fit is there, it's not a job. It's a calling. And it changes everything. It makes you passionate about what you do, and it brings a real value to your life as you do this. And in fact, I believe that the real fulfillment comes from not only using the talents you have, but the opportunities that come from growing them even more. It's when you're growing new muscles of ability that you are most satisfied. The second thing I always hear from folks is about their coworkers. If you go to any retirement party, and I bet you if you thought about what you were going to miss most, your friends was probably at the top of the list. I'm not talking about um, missing just friendships, though. What I'm talking about, and what I hear everywhere, is that the value of being part of a team was also incredibly important. Even the most gifted individual in any company or organization will tell you that they depend on others for the support, the challenge, the inspiration, and the guidance that made their achievements possible. Even the most technical field of work in science is, in the end, a people business. We are born to be part of communities. And your coworkers do more than help you. They are partners with you. They share that journey. And they will actually define you. It's by working together and struggling together and dealing tough challenges together uh, that brings an enormous value of camaraderie and spirit. And in fact, if you think about returning veterans from the war, one of the things that you hear about uh, the difficulty of returning to civilian life is this loss of the deep bonds of camaraderie they experienced there. That being in the trenches together, under fire, protecting each other's lives every day, created a bond of brothers that, in fact, uh, uh, they find difficult to rediscover in civilian life. And finally, there's mission. Mission is the purpose of your work. If there's no purpose, it's just action. And we all need a purpose, and we do it all the time. And these can be very simple goals, getting something done or uh, getting a great job, making money. But the most powerful goals are ones that force you outside of yourself. When you serve a goal that's bigger than you, um, when you are part of a really great cause, uh, then the most fulfillment of all is possible. So I've lived my entire professional life to date in government. And I'll admit, when I first started, it was you know the location of the work and a great challenge. Um, but I stayed that long because I felt I was making a difference, whether it was helping our country innovate and compete, whether it was supporting the weather program and helping satellites that uh, save lives, uh, whether it's working on uh, distressed communities. Um, it was the work that I was doing that made a difference that made me stay. And I hear that from every government employee I've ever met. So our lifetime journeys are enhanced if we're serving a bigger cause, and there are lots of them. It can be to have a great family, it can be to improve your community, it can be to heal the sick, educate, protect the weak, serve your country, save the planet. There's lots of them. Your journey and all the hard work that it will entail will be all the richer if it's in the service of a great purpose. And it doesn't matter whether you realize that goal in your lifetime or not. The idea that you're contributing to that cause is what brings the value. So in the end, I can't tell you what choices you're going to face or what your journey will look like. But I can tell you that if you hone in on those values, the ones that I'm sure were honed here at St. Vincent's, in fact, I believe some of the most important learning you were doing wasn't in those classrooms. 
It was what you were learning with your friends and in the full experience of college life. So I encourage you to think about your abilities and gifts, whatever they are, whether they're athletic or intellectual or emotional or social or doesn't matter. The right vocation for you is the one that fulfills you most. Look for good fit. I know that you've built ties with your classmates that are richer than four-year friendships alone would suggest. The shared challenges of living together, growing together, have formed a real community here at St. Vincent's. You now have a band of brothers and sisters that will create bonds of lifetime friendship between you. That can happen as you go forward, so look for the right community. And I know you wouldn't have made it this far if you weren't already working towards a great goal. What you've done, uh, it takes simply too much work to have made it this far with a selfish one. So um, serve a great cause. And when life presents those doors of opportunity and you're facing one of those forks in the road, uh, look to the values at St. Vincent's, find the door that matches your abilities, that leads to the right kind of community, and that serves a great cause. And I can't predict where you're going to be, but I can predict it will be a journey of great fulfillment, great love, and one where you will make a great difference. Again, thank you for sharing this day with me.